you very much. Okay. And uh, if I can ask our four speakers to come down to the front a little bit and perhaps share the lapel microphone, because we'll have the roving microphone going around for questions. Um, I'll start to take some questions first from, from the front. If you can just introduce yourself at first before your question. Yeah, my name is Hussain Girani. Uh, I'd uh, just like to mention that uh, Hezbollah not only protecting the, uh, the Shia shrines in, in Syria, also protecting the Christian uh, uh, holy uh, churches. And uh, we know that everyone knows that picture of uh, Hezbollah uh, soldier, he will he pay contribute to the, to the uh, Mary and the statues in the Jesus statues. I just like that to, to let everyone know that Hezbollah is, is protecting all the minority in, in Syria. Thank you. Thank you. Take that as a comment. Um, could you pass the mic to nationalist and non-interventionist right by leaders such as Steve Bannon, for example, that has been um, quite popular throughout the Western world in the past two years. So you're talking about like the the, the, the alt-right, are you? Or are you talking um, about like the, the factions of the right wing in the United States that don't like the United States in intervening in other countries? Yes, yes. Right. Um, well, I think, uh, I think what was amazing is that when the the airstrikes happened and the, the, the Americans launched missiles at the Shayyad um, air base in, in Homs in Syria. Um, you had this strange circumstance, and I've never seen it before. There were anarchists on Facebook praising the strikes, right? Saying, yes, you know, this is great uh, because this is a horrible Assad regime. It doesn't matter who's launching missiles at, at the Syrian government, you know, it's an evil regime. And, and it made perfect sense because the anarchists have, of course, uh, especially in the Western left context, been very, very supportive of the YPG and their secessionist ambitions on Syrian territory. Um, and then you saw the, the, the alt-right marches coming out. These are the people who, who supported Trump, and they started screaming, um, we want walls, not wars. You know? So in that particular situation, you know, we, we have this strange situation among the left where a lot of a lot of people would look at that that and say, well, you know, um, uh, isn't it supposed to be the other way around? Um, isn't the anti-imperialist position supposed to come from the left and not the right? Um, and so that's why that's part of the reason why I felt compelled to write this thing because that's that's what the Syrian conflict has done. I mean, there are, there are people on 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 the far left, right, who who support the Syrian government, and people on the far right who support them as well. Um, as, as for this non-interventionist thing, I don't, I don't think that it's, it's, it's something that's going to last. There's, there's going to be disillusionment in the United States very, very soon. The question is whether they mobilize. And I think the potential for that comes from within the US military itself. If you remember that back in 2013 when there was uh, the, the chemical weapons attack in, in Huta, what you saw immediately when the United States was suggesting the possibility of escalating by, by actually invading Syria, you saw these, these American army personnel posting photos of themselves in their military uniform with American flags behind them saying, I will not fight for Al-Qaeda, <laughs> right? You know? So I think there is, there's going to be a lot of disillusionment because um, that's just the nature of, you know, uh, expecting American presidents to be different. But at the same time, I mean, if, if you remember Obama, I mean, everyone thought that he was going to be a peacenik president as well, you know? And then he turned out to start wars in Libya, started the war in Syria, and then you know restarted the war in Iraq as well. And then of course you know the Yemen, uh, the Yemeni revolution, the only successful revolution of the Arab Spring is being drowned in blood by the Saudi murder machine with support from um, with support from Donald Trump. And so the disillusionment will set in, and you will see opposition from from places that you didn't previously expect. Is that answer your question? Very much. Pass the microphone down this way. Hi, 
thank you. My name is Katie, and I have a question for Thomas. When you were talking about um, the role of the natural gas pipelines in the war, I wanted to ask you, why is Syria so important as a transit state? Why not Iraq? Why not try and create a war in Iran? After all, Iran has more natural gas reserves and oil than Syria. So why is Syria as a transit state? Syria is important because if you're going to get pipelines from the Middle East, they have to go through Syria into Turkey. There's, there's no other way. Iraq. Iraq. Iraq is south of Syria. They would have to go through, then through Iraq, and then Iraq conceivably would find itself in the same situation Syria does. Um, those countries, Iraq, Syria, they're more about gaining access for Iran, Qatar, to opening. Qatar is a major supporter of various, I mean, ISIS, various militant groups in the Middle East, which oppose Assad. Which I mean, the, the regime in Qatar is extremely uh, pro-US. There's a military base there. I think about uh, a fifth or so of the country is occupied by the US military. So it's essentially you know a garrison nation, if you can call it that. Um, Syria, Iraq, they're important for access. Um, this is the most I can say there. That's what the evidence that I've seen seems to indicate. Um, getting into Turkey as well. In the regime there, well, he's, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I mean, what Ali Erdogan is up to now. He seems he's going to be a dictator but for the time being now that the referendum has gone down that way. Um, but yeah, the most I can say about Syria is that it's important for access. Iraq has obviously its own huge oil and gas reserves, but it needs pipelines as well to get its reserves, and they would link up, as I said, with the Four Seas strategy, the pipeline network there. Um, so, Syria's importance is its access. It's just a transit nation, essentially. Why couldn't they use Iraq, though? Iraq connects to Turkey as well. Iraq. I mean, it's the position that those pipelines would have to go through. And then, I mean, as I said, Iraq would find itself in the same situation Syria does. With, I mean, the country being invaded, overthrown, obviously, as people know. Um, also coming from Iran as well, the pipe, Iran's pipeline, would, as I showed on the map, would go through Syria and into Turkey, then onto Europe. Um, so access is the most that I could say. Uh, can, okay. I, uh, can I add one point? Yeah. Uh, I guess I would like to uh, make the audience comments on this question. Uh, and I think in uh, Lebanon we have two pipelines uh, historically. They came from one from Iran and the other one from Saudi Arabia, and now they are not working. And I think, uh, yeah, the location of Syria, and I think now, I don't think they are talking more about in the media regarding this point, that the FDR want to extract oil and gas from South Lebanon. And I think Syria and Lebanon, sure, for sure, we have to witness a massive war because uh, you know, the coastal line of Lebanon is, is uh, close to 200 kilometers, 210 kilometers, and uh, it's short, it's longer than the Syrian coastal line. And uh, by the way, I think uh, the conflict, we can't isolate the uh, uh, geopolitics, I didn't point further at this point, we can't isolate the uh, Syria from Lebanon in this regard. Even one of our colleagues who pointed to the uh, in Lebanon, uh, to the uh, federations uh, under the uh, ruling under the Ottoman Empire of the Turkish governments against these countries, it used to be some federations. So Baalbek and some areas is, uh, from North and Bihar, they were part of Damascus uh, and the uh, Damascus State, Damascus Federation. Uh, Tripoli has its own uh, federation, Beirut has its own federation. Greater Lebanon, it used to only be what's so called Mount Lebanon, and it has been emerged in 1860 uh, after the sectarian wars, and it's uh, the leader brokered by the Western power to uh, to make an autonomous uh, government as that area. But uh, in summary, I think, yes, yeah, Syria and I had Lebanon at the time, because both of them, and you, you know that regarding the oil, there are some technical issues. Not only the, uh, the distance, there are also technical issues and safety. Safety and technical issues. So it needs experts to explain further the significance of these lands. 
but for sure it's a dangerous uh, area. I just thought I'd quickly address the point before. I, I was thinking maybe the reason why they, uh, Iraq can't be used as a transit state is because they'd have to go through the autonomous Kurdish region, um, which may be a reason why Turkey wouldn't want that, and maybe a reason why they took Jarablus in northern Syria just to have, I guess, a border where it's not controlled by Kurdish regional area. Uh, but I could be wrong, that's just my take. Um, I just wanted to also ask a question to Dr. El Zain. Um, with respect to Hezbollah, how much of an influence do you think Hezbollah has had on the conflict in Syria? Um, has it been more than symbolic? I'm not uh, a military expert in this regard, although I read uh, information regarding the number of troops uh, thousands, five thousand, six thousand of, and the reserve is like 15,000, 20,000. And I, in my point of view, I think that uh, the Hezbollah, the Syrian matter to Hezbollah is a matter of life and death. That's all. Because they don't have another option. In my uh, review to the literature and the discourse of this party, they don't have another option. It's a matter of life and death. And we have to wait. The influence, sure there's an influence in some way, back with the uh, Syrian Arab army uh, airplanes. For sure there are influence in al Qusayr city. Uh, it has been uh, uh, liberated and come back uh, by the hands of the uh, soldiers. And uh, there are other areas they are fighting in, in Syria. But they are, they are focusing, I don't know, but they are focusing, I think, on the border areas. And they have troops uh, deployed in many uh, areas in Syria, in Aleppo and uh, south of Syria. Uh, someone mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Hassan. I just had a question about... Um, Okay, thanks. Okay, hi, my name is Hassan. I had a question um, just directed to everyone in general um, about Israel's involvement. So I know that Israel has been documented, for example, that they've helped and assisted some of the terrorist rebels in, in their hospitals and provided like medical assistance. Uh, has there been any other form of direct sort of involvement with Israel, or is it more so Israel sort of being on the sideline? On the sidelines and not really um, anything other than that. Um, yeah, so yes, you're right, there is that medical uh, aid at the border, and in fact, that Golan Heights region has been used as a sort of de facto buffer zone where these Al-Qaeda and ISIS terrorists can operate um, and regroup in safety because Israel controls that region. And whenever, um, basically, the Syrian Air Force and helicopters go close to that Golan Heights demilitarized zone while um, chasing uh, Al-Qaeda and ISIS, they get harassed by the Israeli military. And in fact, Israel has shot down um, Syrian helicopters that have uh, been following around Al-Qaeda. So there's actually been photographs of um, IDF soldiers in the demilitarized Golan Heights border hanging out with Al-Qaeda militants. You can Google it and there they are. Um, on top of which, you know, uh, the only party to this war that Israel has been attacking has been the Syrian state. They have been constantly trying to do airstrikes in different areas of Syria to undermine the Syrian state and its fight against the terrorists constantly. And of course, there's political influence that Israel has had um, in APAC, the US government, you know, the Zionist lobby has been pulling, pushing really hard for regime change in Syria. Uh, the United Nations, um, in 2012, before any chemical weapon was used, uh, Israel was already talking about chemical weapons. Um, you know, the Israeli president, they already uh, stated since 2011 that they want Assad to go. And, Kurt, did I forget anything, Jerry? Maybe? Well, I mean, there's the... Um, uh, president Assad was asked about this once, and he said, um, when people ask me, does uh, Al-Qaeda have an air force, he says, yes, I mean... <laughs> 
Uh, <laughs> he said, yeah, I mean, Israel is Al-Qaeda's Air Force. Um, I heard, when, when the conflict first began, I remember one of the first reports that I heard was that, um, and these are really unverified, but um, you can look at it in terms of um, the black market supply of weaponry. So the prices of, of a lot of like you know basic small arms started to fall, and the theory is that the Israelis were basically flooding the market, knowing that it would end up in the hands of, of the biggest buyers in that region, backed with Saudi money. Um, and then we've already talked about the the, the treatment of, of Al Nusra, Al Qaeda fighters in, in Israeli hospitals, and Israel has repeatedly launched airstrikes against the Syrian government in ways that strategically benefit the Al Qaeda insurgency. So. I think that's One last thing. Unless you don't want to. Okay, last thing. Um, basically, at the beginning of the conflict, there was these reports that, oh, uh, Israel wants Assad to stay. Of course, that was completely overturned by the statements of the Israeli government. But I think that the reason why, like, Haaretz would come out with a story like that is to convince the left that there's some kind of secret conspiracy between Assad and Israel, and that in order for the resistance to be, you know, free, they need to change that government. And uh, finally, I just want to make a statement about the Israeli um, organ trafficking ring, which has also been um, very heavily uh, involved in stealing organs on the Turkish border, like Syrian people's organs. So, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brian. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the Golden Heights because I wanted to ask if you thought that um, I'll go back. there is an oil company called Genie Energy listed on the um, New York Stock Exchange and the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. And if you're a shareholder, you're excited about the fact that they have discovered oil in northern Israel, except the northern Israel they referred to as the Golden Heights. And, the consultative board of Genie Energy has sitting on it uh, names you might be familiar with, Dick Cheney, um, <laughs> Rupert Murdoch, uh, James Wolsey, former head of the CIA, um, Larry Summers, former head of the Federal Reserve, Bill Richardson, former Democratic Governor of New Mexico, uh, and Jacob Rothschild. Do you think they have any interest? <laughs> Do you think they have any interest in uh, where the pipeline might go and its impact on Syria and their investment in northern Israel, slash the Golden Heights. I'd give that to someone else, actually. I know we're going to add a little bit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, you basically just answered your question, Bob. <laughs> Do you want to answer that? Or? I have just, I mentioned about the government, then, and the, mm -hmm. yeah, and the, uh, I think the extraction of oil and gas primarily is from the sea. From the Mediterranean Sea, I think. And I think it's not, I'm, I'm not sure if there's something happening in, 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 in Golan Heights. There is. So you look at GNI Energy on the New York Stock Exchange, yeah, GNIE, yes. see where it's exploring, see who's on the board, yeah. and they know what he is. But they said the fund in Golan Heights. Yeah. 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 If this happens, it's according, I think it's one of the biggest breach according to international law. Yes. Yeah, right. because it's an occupied territory for international law. <coughs> Now they, they, have, they have, have to have a meeting with the Security Council. Yeah. You know, we talk with our allies. Yeah. Just kidding. We have another question. Yeah. Hey, um, hey uh, my name is Fahad. Um, I had a question specifically, I think, for Jay and Moran um, about the sectarianism in the Middle East. So I'm I'm someone who's Sunni born, but I've come to sympathise with the, you know, the Hezbollah position um, a lot more strongly. Um, I um, would I guess ask, how big do you think the problem of sectarianism is in the Middle East, and do you foresee there being uh, a movement towards some kind of Arab unity in that regard in the future, be that religious or cultural? In the Syrian Syrianism. Um, actually, well, I think you you would have told me that you would have reminded me that before the Iraq War, um, this Shia Sunni thing wasn't a thing. There wasn't any sectarianism there. In fact, even uh, you know, the, the, it was more like uh, the Muslim world against. Wouldn't you say that? It was yeah. I mean, it was, it was a little more complicated than that. I mean, with Iraq, I mean. 
there certainly is a history of sectarianism. I mean, when I said in my talk that uh, the Sunnis historically have been dominant, what, I'm actually, what I actually said is that if you look at like Islamic history, Sunni Islam has been the, the religion of the state, whereas Shia Islam historically has been the religion of protest against the state, right? And the Shiites have only really been in power um, in that long history in the 10th century when the Fatimids were in control. The Fatimids, of course, built Cairo, right? That's long history. Now looking at like, you know, the, the shorter period of history, what happened in 1979 is that you know, the, the great historic civilization that is Persia, modern day Iran, they took on Shia Islam, Shia Islam as their, their state ideology, and that represented a threat to the Gulf monarchies, right? And so if you look at like the, the Iran-Iraq war in particular, um, there, was this, there were these conflicting narratives that started to emerge. The Ba'athists in Iraq said this is a war between like Arab nationalists and Persians, right? So they cited the Battle of you know Padasia, right, when the Muslim armies defeated the Persians, right? Whereas from the the Iranian point of view, this was you know Karbala all over again, right? This is you know um, the, the the oppressive you know Sunni tyrants in Damascus, no different from the Abbasids, for example, right? Had to be defeated, and he was call he was calling on. On, on the, the people of Iraq and really hinting at the Shia to rise up and overthrow the government, right? Now, what's happened ever since then is that like Sunni chauvinism in particular has been has been resurrected in a really, really big way, right? And this was resurrected after the invasion of, of Iraq in 2003. So, yes, I mean, Iraq had its own sectarian differences, but we can't forget that, you know, during that entire period of war with Iran, Iraqi Shia troops regularly turned up to their barracks, regularly put on the uniforms and defended their country, right? Because for them, it's like, we're Iraqi first, you know, we're Arabs first, right? We're defending our country against the Persians, right? After the uh, invasion of Iraq in 2003, um, uh, what happened in 2005 really kind of shocked the Americans because they thought that they could intervene. Topol Saddam was saying, replace the government with a compliant uh, puppet regime or something like that. But instead what happened is that um, like one of the most uh, influential clerics in Shia Islam, Ali Sistani, issued a fatwa immediately after the occupation saying, no, we do not accept the Bremer constitution because the Bremer constitution is undemocratic. If there's going to be a constitution in Iraq, it has to be arrived upon through a democratic decision-making process. And so eventually the Americans had to offer elections to the Iraqi people as a concession. And what do those elections result in? it resulted in pro-Iranian political parties taking power in Baghdad. And that's when the Saudis in particular and the Israelis got really, really upset and they said, listen, this is horrible. Well, you got rid of Saddam and now you've actually just expanded the Iranian sphere of influence, right? These two countries that spilt each other's blood for eight years are now friends, right? How could you do that? And then the possibility of Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon becoming one contiguous bloc is a major threat to Saudi Arabia and Israel. And so they had to create a counter, counterweight to that. And so that's why they relied on old, very old Sunni chauvinism. They had to resurrect it. It's not something that's, norm, that's normally in the minds of ordinary Sunnis. It has to be learned and taught, right? So for example, the fatwa that I mentioned by Ibn Taymiyyah, he said the, the Shia, or like the Rawafid, which is a derogatory term for Shia Muslims, right? They are more disbelieving than the Christians and the Jews, right? And this is something that's been hammered, hammered into the minds of young converts to Islamic State all the time, right? But ultimately, what is the geopolitical purpose? What does, what's the purpose that this serves, right? It's to prevent the unification of these countries, right? Into a contiguous bloc. So that's the way I explain sectarianism in the Middle East. There's no kind of, you know, one side. There's the idea that you can basically say a pox on both houses, I condemn both sides, right? Is kind of nonsense in this, situ in this situation, let's say. I would disagree. I know. <laughs> 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 I, I think, uh, I think the, uh, regarding these uh, edit one. Sorry, um, can I? Yes, I can say the disagreement and then go to Hatta. Okay, yes, yeah. alright, sorry. I just want to disagree with almost half of. <laughs> um, basically, like I do think that there was um, a sort of Saddam was Sunni. However, there was a multi-religious government in Iraq at the time. Yes, and you know what? Maybe that gave way not to Sunni chauvinism, but it gave way to Shiite 
chauvinism because you have now a religious Shiite dominated government in Iran. And you could say that Iran out influenced the United States out of Iraq because they made themselves such that they were holding a gun against the United States' head in the sense that they could control whenever there's resistance uprisings from the Shiite side. And the US really wanted to quiet down at least one sect while fighting the other. But, you know, on the other hand, if you were looking at it in a bigger picture, actually, this might have played into their hands all along. Because what you ended up with is people from the Sunni side or, you know, of Al Anbar who were getting completely decimated in Fallujah with depleted uranium bombs. And what would they do? They would look at towards Iran, and Iran was like basically um, bringing in all of the politicians in Baghdad that were allowing this to happen. So really, it's not so much like um, it's just Sunni so chauvinism rising up because now they they've been disenfranchised. No, it's like. The fact is, you know, sectarianism breeds sectarianism, and there it is both sides, and there are very sectarian elements in the Shiites as well, who call every Sunni person they meet Wahhabi. So, um, that is something I want to say. And I'm on the upside, I'm thinking secularism has really come back in a big way ever since these wars, especially in Syria, and people are just sick and tired of it. So, sorry. Uh, we've discussed this for like hours. <laughs> uh, just, uh, I want to add uh, for both of my colleagues one point. Just, uh, uh, she asked scholars, uh, I remember the, the, the late uh, Sayyid Muhammad Hussain Fadullah, uh, he, uh, he was uh, against the uh, invasion, um, uh, the coalition, what you call coalition invasion to Iraq. And uh, I, uh, I used, I conducted uh, an interview with the late uh, Fuad Ajim, a schooler and supporting the Republicans, and got a book, The Foreigner's Gifts, who verified in that book the uh, Iraq's occupation. And in that book he told me, and I read that statement, that he, uh, he can't understand why uh, Sayyid Fadullah, who used to live uh, in the city of Najaf and he studied there, how we denounce this occupation, which is in his favor, of Shia's favor. Although Sayyid Fadullah refused, even after that, to go to Iraq, uh, to visit the city of Najaf, because, because Iraq is under occupation. Although, although yeah, many, many Shia scholars used to study that, consider this occupation, even in Afghanistan, occupation, in many areas, call it occupation. No one called it like coalition forces, as it has been used in some media articles. This is my point of view when I witness the, the, the media discourse or media outlets. Secondly, one of the issues is about this object, I, I, this drug, I think, sectarianism, which is, has been, a, has been uh, poisoned uh, from those scholars you mentioned, the scholar mentioned earlier. I think the issue has happened if we go back in history to Afghanistan and uh, how the term jihad emerged in the Western media discourse, when many uh, went from Arab countries, particularly from the Gulf, to fight in Afghanistan, to fight the infidels represented by Soviet Union forces to liberate that uh, country. They used religion to fight, uh, to fight uh, uh, atheists. By the way, this youth, what's their future? What has happened? That's allowed and helped in spreading heinous ideology and brutal culture. And what we are witnessing today is that there may be some of part, partially as a result of what has happened in Afghanistan and later in Iraq. We have in history, we have brutal images, brutal narrations about sectarian bloodshed has happened. Thousands may be killed in one day or a week. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we now policy is playing the rule. And I think uh, we have to fight this ideology. Notably in Islam there is no difference between ideology and politics. And that is the issue.
push the button up. Uh, my question is mostly push the button up. Push the button up. <laughs> <laughs> my question is uh, mostly for Moran. Um, what, uh, in your opinion, given that you are much more intimately, uh, what, in your opinion, um, given that you are much more intimately acquainted with the conflict, is going to be the fate, do you think, of the areas currently occupied by Islamic State once the war ends? The fate of the areas ruled by the Islamic State once the war ends. Okay, so I'm a Syrian national, so I'm going to say that we will take back every inch of Syria. We will be under <laughs> Well, um, no, I guess I can't, can't explain it. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, question down here. Uh, my name is Andrew Catalanos. Two, two questions, and whoever feels like taking them. The term Wahhabism just came up, and Salafist is a term I'm really not familiar with. Can you just describe what they mean and how they fit into the, the conflict generally, as a first question? The second one's much more practical. During the American attack on Syria, 59 cruise missiles were launched, but all the evidence indicates only 23 actually found their mark, and the airport was running the next day with minimal evidence of damage. Does anyone have any understanding of whether those 36 missiles were brought down by Russian intervention or just complete incompetence on the part of the Americans? And that would have a serious impact on their military prowess in the area. That's a two-thirds failure rate for a, um, a guided missile, which is extreme. Jay, you can answer. Oh, okay. I mean, the thing about um, the, the word Salaf, I believe, refers to the first few generations of, of like Islamic rule. So it refers to the, the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad. And then, of course, like the first uh, four rightly guided caliphs, as the Sunnis refer to them, right? Um, and so, but these days it's actually used to refer to um, uh, like the, the, the ultra conservatives. So, for example, um, those who come out of the, the Hanbali school of Islam. I mean, Amongst the four Sunni madhabs, right, so there's like, you know, Hanafi, Shafi, um, Maliki, and, and Hanbali, the Hanbalites are really only about 3%, right? And of that 3%, and, and the thing is, the thing is, they have uh, like Saudi Arabia behind them. Saudi Arabia is a state backing this, like, trend, right? And then out of this trend comes, for example, people like Ibn Taymiyyah, right, who's a very well known. Um, very well respected among those who identify as Salafis, right? He's the one that I said before said that the Shia are more disbelieving than the Christians and the Jews, right? Um, and so, really, it depends on, on how they define themselves in their particular era. So, in this particular era, the Salafis are, are really define themselves by their genocidal hatred of Shia Muslims, right? So, that's, that's really what ties them together. Wahhabism um, is, is, a, is a much more later phenomenon. So that refers to a man by the name of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, right? And, this, and he was um, uh, someone who, who approached the Saudi uh, royal family because um, the Saudis were, were launching an insurgency against the Ottoman Empire at the time, back in the 1800s, right? And so the Saudis basically said, look, you know, we'll bring our tribal affiliations and networks together, you give us an ideology, and under this banner we'll fight against the Ottoman state, right? And that's how kind of Wahhabism really began as a political movement, right? As an expression of Saudi Arabia's um, uh, ideology and political influence, generally. Now, what about the attacks of the Shaykh? Oh, did you want to add something about Wahhabism? I feel like you do. No, no, I'm going to talk about Russia. Just, I, I want to point that the term Salafi itself, which is the like ancestors, it's not, uh, it's not necessarily a bad terminology. However, uh, because it's used in Arabic, as Salaf as Salih, which is the uh, good ancestors. However. Uh, this uh, term has been deviated from its 
right to use, to, and it has been intertwined with the jihadist and uh, we can classify them extremists or terrorists in the sense that they use violence to achieve their agendas or not. Uh, the problem is, with these challenges, uh, quickly, the, they, uh, they have problem in, uh, in the interpretation of the uh, hadith and uh, the verses of the holy book. That's why, in their interpretation, they don't distinguish between the authentic hadith and other hadith. That's why they, they said, all these hadiths are right, okay, we'll, we'll work up on them, and then they, they use many uh, uh, clear Quranic verses which are opposing this hadith, and this is one of the <coughs> bigger problems. Secondly, the uh, founders of uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, Abdul Aziz, used uh, this, uh, this group, this faction, to build, uh, to build uh, his kingdom, and uh, he used uh, tricks and a lot of things with, with them in order to fight and uh, to take over the uh, Hashim, what's it called? Uh, Hashimit, the grandfather of Hashim, Hashimit regime or Hashim, Hashimit family in the in nowadays Saudi Arabia. But at the end, of, uh, regarding just quickly, I, just I, what I'm thinking, I was thinking about about these missiles and about what had happened <coughs> against uh, Ashur Iran and uh, all this uh, discourse in the media, which is can't be explained. But at the end of the day, when I'm, when I'm taking now, like I'm flying and on the wall, not an elephant in the room. <laughs> Just it's, uh, how much does cost, does cost the Americans 59 Tomahawk cross missiles? How many millions of dollars? I think Syrian people, people who are poor, they deserve this money. What, what they achieved? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Money that was made in the stock market by some of us, five billion. We understand this is what they achieved in terms of, of the people who are suffering from the war. Care. Care. That's what I meant. What I meant. Yeah. Give the money for them. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, Wahhabism, this little comment, sorry, I don't speak in a while, but um, it's a cult. They are a messianic cult. They are pushing for the end of the world, which makes them very similar to Zionism. Um, they believe that if they take over Damascus, Jesus will come down again on Damascus and the, the, the apocalypse will begin. Um, and of course they were born of Saudi Arabia. And I, I've heard, I'm not very, I can't say for sure, but British intelligence may have been involved as well with Wahhabism. Um, yes, and the British intelligence, yes. And the, the, the striking feature about them is they value hadiths more than Quran. Quran is supposed to be the direct word of God. Hadiths are like hearsays of what people said people said. And so, for example, um, some people say that the Prophet wore eyeliner. And then you see a lot of like Wahhabis walking around wearing eyeliner. And so, <laughs> this is like, because they take things very literally, very uh, practically, and they're basically the opposite of an esoteric um, way to think about religion. And with the Tomahawk missiles, now we're, this, there's so much different conflicting information. Um, one thing I've heard is that they may not have been shot down by Russia, but they may have been deflected by Russia by these a special type of radar jamming devices that would deflect them. Um, you, maybe you can expand on that. But I've, there's also conflicting information about whether Russia knew beforehand or was told beforehand or didn't know. Um, Russia says that either the U.S. told them, the Secretary of State said he didn't, Assad said that they didn't, um, the U.S. Uh, MOD said that they did, and um, it seems to me that people still died. I mean, six Syrian soldiers died, and some say even two uh, Russian soldiers died. If you are a bit conspiratorial thinking, because uh, a day later they announced the death of two soldiers but wouldn't give details on where and when, um, so perhaps this was kind of a de-escalation statement. But so whether they, why the damage wasn't severe? Maybe it was a deflection. Maybe um, they lifted off the airplanes. But at the end of the day, the reason why the U.S. used those Tomahawk missiles is because they can't reach Syria by plane. They can only reach them by boat because we have air defenses, and that is why they're trying to knock out our air bases because they want to dominate Syrian skies. So. Yeah. Uh -huh. Can I add just one thing? Homs Air Base is targeted by the, I'm sorry, the Russian, 
uh, was targeted by uh, the US with the so-called 59 pound missiles was the air base that launched S-200 and downed the Israeli warplane just two weeks before the attack. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, sorry. So I'll finish up on the missile. Yeah, just to talk about the missile. Uh, the Russians have deployed a lot of electronic uh, jamming equipment in the country, um, and the cruise the cruise Tomahawk missiles that were fired use a terrain following map in their memory, um, which takes several days to program. So the media has talked a lot about this was seen to be you know, a spontaneous attack, which which was technically impossible for a cruise Tomahawk missile because it takes a while to program to uh, map out essentially the path that you want to follow to its target. Um, the Russians have deployed their area access, area denial uh, system as well, which is made up of electronic jammers, satellite jammers, things like that. And the cruise missile itself has a fairly mixed track record, uh, given that it's a fairly old design as well from the 90s. Um, in the first Iraq war in 1991, I think the success rate was not 100% as the media would have, it, have us believe. Um, it was, I think, barely about 50%. Yeah, yeah. 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 The first one is, um, sorry I arrived late, but uh, you were talking about the balkanization plans for Syria and the latest US attack was on Deir Ezzur. Deir Ezzur, sorry, that was the previous attack. Okay, but, but if that is to cut the connection in Syria, would you be able to tell us a bit more about the, the, the next steps in the plan, in the war strategy, the American war strategy, okay. if Deir Ezzur goes, if right. they are successful? And, and also what will be requested from Australia as a part of the treaty, if any of you have an idea about that? Yes, um, well, their Zur and Kalka air base are one of the two important air bases that would protect Syria from balkanization, would give Syria um, positions where they can have air defences to prevent US planes from attacking their troops and to be able to harass <coughs> Uh, U.S. aircraft. That is why U.S. troops are now massing around Tabuka Air Base and preventing Syrian military from being able to get in and actually building illegal air bases inside Syria. That's the north. Their Zor is like a little bit um, to the south of that near Palmyra and the, the air base is actually protecting a city that's under siege that has hundreds of thousands of people in it. And the, the, this airstrike was against Homs Air Base the previous one, which was supposedly an accident, was on their Zor Air Base, and that air base has been holding up for three years under the ISIS, under ISIS siege. And if that falls, then hundreds of thousands of people in their Zor are going to be under ISIS control. And with these balkanization plans, you know they, they're planning uh, an invasion from Jordan. What the what the Sir what the Australians, how would they would be involved um, through brainwashing the Australian public and pretending to fly around planes and taking credit for U.S. airstrikes. Because during their Azor, you know, it was really interesting that um, when the accident happened and the U.S. hit Syrian troops, almost every single country wanted to take credit for that, including Australia. And I'm really highly skeptical, but even if we take them at their word, what they're doing is they're committing international, like they're violating international law. They, committing war crimes. So we need to, you know, make this Australian government answer to that. We have another question in the middle there. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi. Um, hi, so sorry, I just have another question. Um, so in, in this module of this conference we talked about imperialism and geopolitics. Another theatre of this war that we haven't talked about um, is Yemen. Um, and Yemen, uh, at the start of the Arab Spring, we would have noticed that Saudi Arabia has progressively um, taken a step back as the Syrian conflict has um, expanded, and it also has a dynamic of where the um, <coughs> Iranian-backed forces are the ones that are instigating this revolution, and the Saudi-backed forces are the government 
um, that are in control. So in um, the grand regional um, uh, view of this um, of the Middle East, would you, uh, would the panel consider that Yemen as a southern theatre of a wider war or as a completely separate war in itself? And who would you support in the, in the Yemeni civil war if you have to take a side? Thank you. Do you mind if I start with that? I mean, um, unfortunately, because I've been spending so much time focusing on Syria, I've, I've, I've really wanted to learn as much about Yemen as I could. But from what I know, I mean, Yemen has had... Actually, my world would probably be the best person, but I'm just going to... I'll just quickly tell you... Um, I, I don't think it's fair to, to, to basically present it as just like an Iranian-Saudi proxy war, because you have to take into consideration the agency of, of the Yemeni like players in this as well. I would say that um, uh, the difference between the Yemeni revolution and, for example, the Syrian revolution is that the Yemeni one actually had popular support. <laughs> you know, I mean, in Yemen, uh, in when they took over Sana'a, I mean, it, it was a relatively easy exercise. They basically just assumed control over the place. And the government, the, the Hadi government, really doesn't have a lot of legitimacy at all. And so what... To the Saudis, what this, what this, uh, uh, what Ansar Allah's takeover of Yemen represents, is the potential for Yemen to to become like an independent, unified nation, right? And I think the the sectarianism is really overplayed. So, for example, it's not simply a Sunni Shia thing in Yemen. It's really like the the Zaydis are actually uh, like the the Shia branch in Yemen, but they're actually referred to as the Sunnis of the Shia and the Shia of the Sunnis. Right? And they historically have had very good relations with, with the Sunni population who are Shafi Sunni. They're not Wahhabi, they're not um, Hanbalite Sunni, they belong to the Shafi school, right? And Imam Shafi, who, who's, which is like who they're named after, right, is actually quite close to the Shia narrative in general, right? Um, and so that's the way I'd present it. Maybe I think Marwa really is the person you should be speaking to, if that's okay. Thank you for the question. My boss, Man from Lebanon. I'm a media studies uh, university instructor and a political commentator and writer. You'll see me in the upcoming phase. Uh, concerning uh, Yemen, we have first of all to um, and identify and correct a bit of the terminology that is being used. First of all, it's not a civil war. It has been since March 2015. Uh, a KSA war, Saudi war against Yemen on all the land uh, of Yemen, whether North or South Aden itself was, was bombed by Saudi Arabia. It has been bombed by Emil, uh, mother of all bombs. But by the way, a mother is never a mother of a bomb. It's called the bunker buster bomb. Uh, they have been bombed with bunker buster bombs. They have been bombed with um, depleted uranium and Sana'a. Uh, two months after the bombing of depleted uranium in 2016, uh, the birth of children were uh, maimed, uh, children without feet or uh, without eyes, etc., etc. What's going on is not a civil war again. Uh, it's not called. Uh, they are. What's happening? It's. It's not rebel against uh, uh, government. The government of Hadi. Hadi has resigned twice. He resigned twice from his position. He was then imposed again as the head of state, uh, which was not a state, uh, to be honest with you. If you go back before the actual war started, there was the, a six-point agreement, which is actually a three-point agreement made into a six-point agreement to uh, make Yemen into a federal state, uh, breaking it into six parts. If you read extensively about that, you, you could know that before the start, before March 15, 2015, before the war started, they were so close on actually agreeing on this agreement to make Yemen into a three-part uh, state, uh, not state, but a three-part uh, region, uh, allocating each region to each uh, a group or political group. It was never uh, a, a sectarian fight because uh, Zaydis are not even Shia. Zaydis follow uh, Imam Zaid, which is the grandson of Imam Hussein. They are not Twelvers. They stop at uh, the grandson of Imam Hussein. Uh, so they are, if you, if you call a Yemeni a Shia, he will punch you in the face. He's a Zaydi. Um, um, and he, he, he's proud of that. He has every right to be. <coughs> now, uh, concerning what is going on in Yemen uh, right now, if you talk about uh, the mainstream media is calling the uh, so-called uh, uh, Houthi insurgents as uh, rebels, they are, first of all, it's not Houthi, it's Ansar Allah. Houthi is one, one tribe out of the thousands of tribes fighting in uh, fighting Saudi Arabia in Yemen. They're just one tribe, so it's called Ansar Allah, a resistance movement. 
And, and Salama resistance movement is not even a Zaidi movement. It has tribes, as uh, Jay was saying, it has tribes uh, from Sunni, uh, uh, from the Sunni sect. It has tribes from the Shia sect, very minor Shia sect in Yemen. And, this, and the, the majority are Zaidis. Now, considering what the fight is being, uh, uh, if you look at all the uh, reports coming from the ground and the mainstream media, they never say a word about Ansarullah law fighting within, let's say, uh, uh, Aden or fighting on uh, alongside their brothers or sisters in Yemen, despite the fact that Saudi Arabia, we have reports, we have videos, we have data of Saudi Arabia collecting uh, uh, Yemenis from the southern of Yemen, taking them all the way to the sea, all the way to the north to put them on the front line because they are not even going to put soldiers, KSA soldiers, Saudi soldiers on the front line because basically they don't know how to fight. But uh, <laughs> even if they did know uh, how to fight, uh, at, that, at that moment in time when we speak and, and, and Saudi Allah taking uh, over uh, the, the war in the northern part, they did not only win the war on the ground despite the fact of the bombardment and the continuous bombardment campaign, they really took land, they didn't occupy land in Saudi Arabia, they really took historical Yemeni land within Saudi, uh, it's Hijaz by the way, it's not Saudi Arabia, within Saudi lands that were, uh, within the Saudi now known borderland, uh, they, they retook those uh, areas, and now they are stationed and positioned there. So they are not fighting the people, they are not killing, they are on the front line, but Saudi Arabia has uh, dared once uh, and again and again and again to kill people uh, through bombing them, to suffocate the people by besieging them. If you look at Adan uh, uh, port, and if you look at seaport, and if you look at uh, Hodaida seaport, Hodaida seaport is the major, 70% of the Yemeni population uh, depend on the Hodaida seaport, and it's working with a 10% capability. Why? Because al Saud are not allowing the shipments from the UN, even UN shipments are not uh, getting there. And when the shipments get there, they are either, uh, they are either expired, uh, uh, the, the food and the medicine is either expired, so it gets um, rid of at the, right there at the airport, they just bump it again in the sea. And if it actually gets there, it is bad. We had more than uh, 100 kids die in Adan, not in Sana'a, not in Sa'ada, not in uh, uh, Hudaida or elsewhere in, uh, in, uh, in the areas that are supposedly uh, uh, under the control of Ansarullah. We had people in Adan, 100 kids in Aden dying because of a polio vaccination that was a bad uh, vaccination. They died because of it. And more than uh, 70 people uh, uh, were, were inflicted by, the, by paralysis because of this. And you know how much this costed the, the Yemeni government? $70 million to conduct these vaccinations. And it ended up killing the, the, the kids of Yemen. So if you want to talk more about why the war in Yemen, and people would ask, them, why is this happening? This is a simple answer. First of all, Saudi Arabia thought that Yemen would be the backyard, their own backyard. Therefore, that we could take it any time. That was proven wrong. The second thing was the fact that uh, the AQAP held areas of Yemen, the desert of Yemen, that is on the southern, uh, the, the south uh, eastern part of Yemen, which is held by the Al Qaeda uh, uh, terrorist faction, is actually, and according to reports that I think, uh, uh, Mr. Um, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, just uh, refer to it as. Um, he was talking about uh, the, uh, the petrol and the oil. We have reports that say that that area, which is occupied by Al-Qaeda, is actually swimming over a pool of oil and the best natural gas on the planet. Yes, so, I hope this answers the question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, 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 there was a, if we can get the microphone down. Okay, yeah, yeah, just, just, just one quick one. one. Sorry, oh. we'll move on. Yemen is a big topic. Um, we have got more sessions coming up where we can talk about Hello, can you hear that? Oh, you can now. Yes. I've been doing some research on the causes behind war, and one of the pieces of research that comes up very quickly is Stephen Pinker's The Better Angels of Our Nature. And he argues that wars have dropped off in Europe and around the Western countries. And the main reason he gives, if you can understand it, is the growth of civilization. I think I've got his term right there. My question to you guys, and you can answer just with a yes or no, Will civilization come to the Middle East? 
or is it not there already? <laughs> The Middle East is the birthplace of civilization. The Middle East was civilized while Europe were just country gatherers. So, I think like the, the kind of Indian nationalist in me also feels like something like <laughs> No, I mean, I think the, the, the history of all of these wars is that they've, they've tried to support, um, uh, you know, some of the most sectarian, violent, divisive, divisive elements in the Middle East to undermine the, the possibility of, of, like, actual, intelligent, effective 20th century executives from taking power. <laughs> and I think that's, um, that generally uh, explains it. So it's actually the other way around. I mean, it's the West that's been trying to drag the Middle East into a, into a situation of chaos and to try and destroy their civilizations. I always say to people, look at um, look at all of the, 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 the artifacts and historical monuments that Islamic State destroyed, right? Now, a lot of people in the West saw that and they said, ah, oh, see, it's just Islam being Islam, right? They're just barbaric and they just destroy things. But then I said, look, those monuments, they survived the Umayyads, they survived the Abbasids, they survived the Seljuks, they survived the Ottomans, I mean, they survived so many uh, Islamic civilizations, right? None of them thought, okay, we should destroy them because we think it's our religion to do so, right? I mean, that's really just a modern thing, right? And so, really, this kind of descent into barbarism in the Middle East is a modern phenomenon, right? It's not an ancient phenomenon because this is, again, I mean, to... to say what's already been said, I mean, we're talking about one of the oldest civilizations in the region, but there's a tendency to look at these countries and say, well, you know, they, they, don't, they don't know how to conduct themselves, they're politically backward and we have to educate them, right? So, for example, Syria, people say, well, Syria is not a, not a democracy, it's not a democracy, but then they ignore the, the, the whole range of sweeping reforms that happened in 2011 and 2012, right? That, for example, got rid of the Ba'ath Party's political monopoly and then introduced a multi-candidate presidential system. The Western media completely ignored that, right? And then when the Western media talks about like the, the, the need for Syria to have democracy, they need to look at their own societies. How many hundreds of years did it take Western Europe to, to end up with a democracy? And that wasn't because they were enlightened, it's because there were there was centuries upon centuries of struggle as well. Right? One last thing. Fifty years ago, Europe were slaughtering each other, so that wasn't that long ago. <laughs> Just uh, regarding civilization, I don't say I don't want to argue that the premise of questions is a problem, and the, <coughs> the answer of the question is uh, some sort of parallelism. And I don't want to point the history of the Middle East. Uh, for example, the uh, school of law, which is, has been destroyed by, by an earthquake, earthquake 555 before Christ. And I don't want to point to the uh, interfaith relations between Muslims and Christians where they're close to each other, like church and mosque. I want to point that our problem is that we have a structural problem, and secondly, those images from leaders where, which you are watching on TV, they don't represent me. Those leaders, like uh, you, you find them, they have only the traditions to wear the traditional clothes, but their mind they, and their actions, they don't provide a good image about the civilization, and they don't know what they are doing. All what they are doing is only to keep their chairs and to kill their peoples, and to tell others be a democratic country why they are not. They, they are talking about the Syrian president. He is an ophthalmologist. And I don't know, and graduated from the United Kingdom. And I don't know what they have, the sort of degrees they have. Maybe they have degrees in brutality <laughs> and following some girls around the world. <laughs> Talk about the Gulf monarchies, aren't you? I'd like to know, can you hear me? Um, what was life like in Syria during the Assad regime before 2011 when the uprising started? 
And why did the uprising start in the first place? What was the prompt? What prompted so many people to rise up against <coughs> the regime? Um, sure. So I was in Syria in 2010, just one year before the uprising. And uh, I've been in Syria since childhood. Every so often years I would go back. And I would say that, um, you know, before the war, like, I love Syria. I love being there. Um, it's a secular country. What it was like in 2010, my friends and I we would go to restaurants and then we'd go to the nightclubs at night. There's cafes open all the time. There's always something to do. You can go bowling. And we even had an opening of like a snow uh, ski land, which doesn't make sense because Syria has snow anyway. So why open a ski land? Um, so, but Syria. In some ways, you could say it was becoming more uh, like capitalist and more westernized. So we had the KFC introduced, um, the basically um, Coca-Cola was allowed again, and some people would have seen that as a positive thing. Like Syria is moving more into a European sphere, but for me, as I was you know from childhood going back to Syria, I really saw it as a negative thing. Because when I would go home to Syria as a child, we had our own Coca-Cola companies. We had something called Double Cola, which I thought was delicious. And when Coca-Cola was legalized, you know, under US pressure, Double Cola went out of business. And all of these Syrian factories and nationalized uh, companies were going out of business. And part of the reason for that was the new president was pressurized by the West to open up the Syrian economy. And I believe that um, you know Syria is such was, was and will be such a beautiful place, um, but I feel that by opening the door to to the West that way, you know, it, it actually opened the door to also Al Jazeera to to propagandize people, and you have Turkey who was uh, cutting off the water supply to Syria, which caused a massive drought. And then you had uh, Iraq propagandizing to people. And you also have, since you know, the 40s, the Muslim Brotherhood movement, which has been basically the strongest opposition to the Syrian government since the beginning. And they tried to have a revolution in the 80s, but nobody wanted them. So they keep trying and failing. Like they, they, they succeeded in Egypt momentarily, and then they got removed again. But the Muslim Brotherhood was the group of people that the U.S. wanted to run Syria because that way they would have a bad relationship with Iran and they could divide the resistance, uh, you know, axis. So the U.S. was uh, pushing forward in the uh, Syrian National Council this fake government that they set up outside of Syria. Most of its members were members of the Muslim Brotherhood. So the reason why this uprising happened. Is, there's multiple reasons, but if you really want to get to the core of why it happened, the number one reason is imperialism. Number two, you have like Saudi, Saudi Arabia wanting to gain influence in Syria. Um, you have the Muslim Brotherhood. Because this group of people that are, have caused all these problems are a small group of people. You know, you say that there was massive uprisings, but there was millions and millions and millions of people on the street saying they want some reforms, but they don't want an overthrow, and they certainly don't want the Muslim Brotherhood, because the majority of Syrian people have time and time again rejected these Muslim Brotherhood guys. So, um, yes, these small group of people who have been armed and trained by Turkey, Britain, and the US, they have been destroying everything. And of course, they also welcomed in every single foreign fighter in the world, from Uzbekistan to Chechnya to the United States. And um, these are the people that we're fighting right now. It's in no way a revolution. Muslim Brotherhood, by the way, Muslim Brotherhood is, uh, which uh, I think uh, there's a problem between Muslim Brotherhood and Saudi Arabia. And uh, during the early stages of the uprising, uh, I read uh, reports that they called the uh, Syrian president and the, to attack uh, harshly the Muslim Brotherhood faction. And Muslim Brotherhood, uh, they, if you hear uh, the Islamic resistance movement of Hamas in, in, uh, in Gaza, they are from Muslim Brotherhood. And it's, I think now what's going on, I don't think they have influential voice at this stage in the conflict of Syria. 
uh, and I think now it has sent to the Saudi voices. Also, the Turkey now the uh, Turkish government Erdogan uh, he is considered uh, his party uh, one uh, as a Muslim Brotherhood aligned with the Muslim Brotherhood or hold the same ideology. I think no one of you has mentioned that all what's happening now is because just for the Israeli uh, safety. That's that's, yeah. that's the whole problem in the Middle East. Just for the sake of I think, I think, I think we've got time for perhaps another question and then we'll give our um, we'll give our speakers a rest. We do have an afternoon session where we can carry on, of course, at two o'clock. Um, but we we've, we've only got time for maybe one or two. Uh, good. I was hoping I'd get you um, you mentioned that the, the key word there's a number of key words I hear and have examined over the years and that's the word secular. And the two most secular states are the ones that have been torn apart most obviously and most recently. And you also refer to the messianic nature of the Wahhabis. Um, sitting alongside everything that's happening, uh, in my reading and my own interests, um, you also mentioned Zionists. Now, Christian Zionists and evangelicals in America share a similar messianic view of the world. And in you know, the word Armageddon actually derives from the plains of Megiddo, which is where the end of days must happen for the return. So, whether, the, whether you are Muslim, whether you are Christian, if you are messianic in the view of the world, and as I understand it, there are many groups in America fund both sides so they can make sure that there's continual conflict because it must happen there for the return. Um, that fits in with some of what I saw on the side of the Hegemonic Association, or your group, um, a paper today that refers to what's called the Yunnan Plan, and which was rebadged as the central danger by Paul Wolfowitz in the late 90s, which is the examination of the State of Israel re re um, going back to the biblical boundaries from the Mediterranean to the Euphrates, which essentially, in terms of that plan, covers what is actually happening now. So sitting right alongside what is a secular, sorry, what is a corporatist takeover of the Middle East. And we have, you know, there's a beautiful, the first, a good example of that was Spain in the 30s, and then now that all played out. But, so that in itself is, do you see them sitting together, a coincidence, or is that an influence? Is it all rolled up into one big, happy, bizarre, messianic family? You know, I'm always thinking about that. I'm really always thinking about what is the bigger influence. Is it the messianic crazies that are pushing the, you know, things forward? Or is it the corporatists? Or is it just about power? Is it really just about power? And I think that when you try to analyze um, you know, certain situations and why things happen, sometimes it basically looks like it's just about power because they've spent so much money to take over Iraq that it, it stands to reason that they couldn't possibly make up for it by stealing Iraq's oil. So, okay, so then it must be about hegemony, it must be just about power. And then sometimes you, you think that, well, wait, like these messianic uh, pulls and, and influences, they, they seem like completely insane. But is it possible that the world leaders are really that insane? And it does stand in the face of secularism, because we want to move forward from these things, but they keep trying to make the end of the world happen. And there will be, and for the Messiah to come. And yes, it, that same thing is in the evangelists, it's in the Zionists, and now it's in ISIS, so thank well, you. I guess uh, there's two things I'd add to that. Uh, this is completely uh, sidetracking, but... Um, Sorry, we're not sidetracked. Oh, okay, I'll leave it with the last thing there. For anyone who's interested in going back, um, something you said, Jay, there is a fabulous document that was around years ago called On Company Business, which is the story of the CIA and World Affairs. And there's a great film clip where there's a shot of the facts that is sent from Henry Kissinger to say, OK, let's take out Salvador Allende. And the guy who signed it was a very early career, Paul Bremer, who you mentioned earlier on. Yeah. OK, thank you for the comments. Can we have up the back, one last at the back? Just a very more. quick question on Russia. Yep. Uh, is just a very quick question. Just a very quick question on Russia and uh, Moscow's involvement in the uh, Syrian theatre. Um, what would you say are some of the successes and failures uh, of the Kremlin of the Kremlin's involvement in Syria? I open that to the entire panel. Uh, 
Well, the number one success is to help the Syrian army retake Aleppo, um, to to stand in the way of you know possible U.S. invasion and uh, destruction of, of Syrian air bases. I would say the failures would be um, number one, giving up chemical weapons, like influencing Syria to give up its chemical weapons, because it's almost like Russia was playing good cop bad cop with Syria. Russia's interest in Syria, Russia doesn't want Syria to have chemical weapons because it doesn't want Syria to have its own agency. It wants Syria to be completely under the influence of Moscow. So it stands to reason that Russia wouldn't lose anything by pressuring the Syrian government to give up its chemical weapons. And, you know, this, the chemical weapons would, by themselves have been uh, something that would prevent in, invasion, but Russia using its influence over Syria and Syria finding itself in a dire circumstance, you know, they influenced them to give up their chemical weapons, and only then was uh, the, the Russian uh, troops inside Syria. You might think that um, you know Syria really desperately wanted Russia to, to enter its uh, land, and that Russia is doing Syria a big favor by doing so. But you might maybe there's a counter narrative to that: that Syria was reluctant to let Russia enter its territory, and it came to the point where it was forced to do so, and Russia has always wanted to enter. You know, that, that's, a, that's another way you could look at it. Because um, Russia is, like, and, as any state would, looks after Russia. And, and it's looking after Russia in the sense that it doesn't want to uh, strengthen Syria enough that it could stand on its own feet. Otherwise, they would have given us nuclear bombs yesterday. But, um, and also Russia has its, like, relationships with the United States and Israel, and it's always sort of holding Syria back on that front. And that's something that Iran and Russia have always had an argument about. And I would say, final, on the final front, you know, now again the issue of the Kurds and balkanization. You have Russia pushing federalism onto the Syrian government, and Assad saying no, and then this strike happens. So, like, while well, Russia has been a great ally and... Of course, the Russian people and Syrian people have had a long history together and they've shed blood together. There are Zionist influences inside the Russian government as well, and they have, in a way, like, for their, only really tr gone for their own interests and not for the interests of Syria. And that's, I guess, to be expected in politics. Oh, just about the, the chemical weapons thing, I mean, one of the things that, that people just didn't talk about when, um, when the first uh, allegation against the Syrian government happened in August 2013 was what chemical weapons actually were for Syria strategically. Now, to those people, I, it's only recently that I've started to say, look, if Syria really did use its sarin, we wouldn't be talking about 50 dead, we'd be talking about 50,000 dead. And that's because they were not configured as tactical weapons, they were configured as a strategic deterrent and they were loaded onto Scud missiles capable of devastating cities. And it was the only kind of strategic deterrent that Syria really had to the country in the region, or the, the, the entity in the region that has the, the ultimate strategic deterrent in the form of nuclear weapons, and that's Israel. Um, and so, while everyone was talking about, oh, well, should we attack Syria for using chemical weapons, what a lot of people within Syria were thinking was, okay, well, have we just disarmed ourselves? Have we just left ourselves open to, to, to an attack? At that time, we thought, okay, you know what, it's good. The Russians have actually mediated the situation. they prevented a conflict, but what it's, what it's ultimately resulted in is the disarming of Syria and the undermining of Syria's sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Look, there's a lot of interest in this. I know we could go on forever, but I don't want it to go on forever. No, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm not going to allow any more questions because our speakers need a break. Our speakers need a break, and uh, we do have four more speakers coming on at 2 o'clock this afternoon, and all of the themes that you've raised today can be carried on at 2 o'clock. So can we thank our speakers very much?